Morning, everyone. Hey, I'm live for sound. That works. Excellent. Um, so, my title for today, Prayer, Fasting and Compassion, not necessarily in that order. In the 95% of life, I added that in because of uh, Jeremy's talk last week. You might remember he was reminding us that however many meetings we come to, and some of us might feel we have more than others, but, you know, however many we come to, we probably only spend about... 5% of our life in that context. The other 95% is where the real stuff happens. And, and I want to, to, to try and unpack some of this stuff. It's, it's uh, something which I've, I've felt God stir me about actually a couple of years ago when I was coming back from a time in Sierra Leone. And, um, and uh, felt God give me something on the plane, uh, which I then wrote, and then I forgot about. And then I was reminded. So today is kind of an exploration of some of those thoughts, some more thoughts, and some more thoughts. So uh, we'll see, see where we end up. Um, now, uh, my daughter, uh, well, I have two lovely daughters. Uh, my, my, my daughter, who's still with me at home, is in year 10 and is approaching that magical time called work experience. And, um, well, it appears... Um, I, 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 her school uh, uh, released a video, actually, um, based on another child's work experience. So what's, what's the kind of opposite of compassion? And I think it's, it's that thing, isn't it? It's that talk to the hand, my face not listening. It's the, I just don't care what you think. Anyway, um, what I thought we'd do was, um, okay, so what's the opposite of be, not being bothered? Well, I reckon it's about having compassion. That's my link. Uh, that was the comedy over. Anyway, <laughs> so, so God's told us, that this is a time when we're going to be being more compassionate. We're going to have more compassion. We've been asking for it, and we know that if we ask, then we receive. Um, in Colossians 3.12, um, Paul writes that as God's ho- chosen people, holy and dearly loved, we should clothe ourselves with compassion. That means it's something we kind of cover ourselves with. It's something that we put on. There's an active kind of taking hold of this thing called compassion. It's the antithesis of what the world says, which is, I can't be bothered to listen to you. I'm not interested in your point of view. Actually, what matters is me. I am the centre of everything. This is what matters. But actually, compassion is when it says, no, actually, you are the centre. The other people are the centre. And I'm going to centre my life around my love for them and everything that they... Uh, everything that God gives me to do in their lives. 2 Corinthians 1.3 says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles. Why? So that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. There is, we are not a dead end for God's compassion. When he comforts us, the expectation and the, the, the empowerment is to be able to comfort others. It's not something which finishes with us. There is something about God investing comfort in us which enables us to comfort others. Things need to bother us. Things need to bother us. You see, um, there was a church in Laodicea, which Jesus talks about in, in Revelation, that talks about um, then, well, this is, this is the scripture. I know your deeds, says Jesus about the church, that you're neither hot nor cold. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you're lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. See, lukewarmness is the antithesis of the kingdom. We cannot be half-hearted Christians. We cannot be half-hearted followers of Christ. We have to be completely sold. We have to be completely pursuing after him. So if that's true, and if that's what, uh, that's what compassion leads to, uh, it makes us hot in the face of, of there being difficulties and, and struggles, what I want us to do now is to just think for a moment, what things can we use to measure how bothered we are uh, about the world around us? I just want you to, in, in sort of pairs and threes, just have a quick chat with the person next to you, or maybe a few people around you. What things do you think would be a good temperature gauge? We talk about certain things in our life being like a temperature gauge of, of our kind of state. I'm not saying that they guarantee it, because they're an external sign quite often. But think about things that might indicate how much you're bothered by your friends, what's going on around you in the world. A couple of minutes, go. I'm going to tell you some things I thought of, 
and then at the end you can tell me if there's any that you, you didn't come up with, all right? Okay, so these are not necessarily guarantees. Uh, this is an external, often external thing. So here's, here's one. When did you last share something that God has done for you? Tell someone your testimony. Tell someone a way that God has interacted with you in your life. When did you last think about your giving? Or did you feel provoked to give something that was surprising or different to what you normally do? When did you last feel moved to pray for someone or something? Well, of course, we do that all the time, don't we, when we're together? I think what I mean with that is, like, you're in the 95%. And maybe you're with someone having a conversation and you think, I've got to see God break into this situation. You understand what I mean when I say we're in the 95%? Or is that a common? You know, we're not in a meeting context. It's like part of our everyday life. When did you last think about your serving? Is it all a routine? Or find yourself doing something that surprised you? I remember helping um, the McKernans to uh, move house. And uh, they weren't in the country at the time. And it was a surprise to me that I was uh, in the middle of doing that. And that's quite a few years ago. I can think of some other more close examples, but it's something that uh, I remember emptying, that was when they lived in a lot in a flat on the top floor, and we had to go up into their loft and empty it. I was helping someone called Andrew Payne, and uh, I'd offered Andrew to help him move uh, them, and uh, we turned up, and there was a little bit left to do, wasn't there, Claire? But it was, it was like one of those exciting journeys, because they didn't know what was going to happen next, okay? When did you last feel moved to fast for something, without being told to? What's fasting? Well, we're going to talk about that in a moment. And when did you last do any of these when there was no one else to know about it? See, I think God's calling us to a time of battle. Um, the Bible talks about, uh, Paul writes in Ephesians 6.12, that our fight is not against the people on earth, but against the rulers and authorities and the powers of this world's darkness, against the spiritual powers of evil in the heavenly world. That's really important to remember, because sometimes the enemy's battle with us has a human face, and there's someone who's making my life difficult, but my battle is not with that person, never is. My battle is with the enemy, who would want to distract me and pull me away from God's purpose. But Paul writes in 2 Corinthians some words of strength to us, but we, though we live in the world, we don't wage war as the world does. For the weapons we fight with are not the weapons of this world. On the contrary, they have the power to demolish strongholds. Now that word, on the contrary, what does, or that phrase, on the contrary, what does that mean? Not, not like the other thing, right? The weapons of this world cannot demolish strongholds. Jesus is our stronghold. The weapons of this world cannot demolish strongholds. But we can demolish strongholds that set themselves up against the kingdom of God. Because it's something that God's put into our hands. So our struggle, our fight, our way of life is something which God has given us. But he's given us weapons. He's not left us ill-equipped. When we were praying together in January, uh, somebody shared that this was a season that when, when we should be expecting our prayers to be answered as never before. This is a season when God is turning up the temperature. The battle around us may be fiercer, fiercer but he's equipped us for such a time as this. Jesus talks about brother being turned against brother. He says, I've come to bring a sword. But Jesus has given us, through the power of the Spirit, the ability to not fight with the human face, but to fight with the enemy who is behind the strife, who's behind the battle. For we demolish every argument and pretension that sets itself up to, against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. So when Jesus is teaching about prayer in Luke 11, this is what he says. He says, suppose one of you has a friend and you go to him at midnight and, uh, at midnight and say, friend, lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine on a journey has come to me and I've no food to offer him. And suppose the one inside answers, don't bother me, the door's already locked and my children and I are in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you bread because of friendship, 
Yet because of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. What's shameless audacity? Bare-faced cheek, basically. It's, it's, sticking, it's sticking at something when it's really not reasonable. This is after dark. This is a time when everyone was asleep. The children and the adults would probably have slept on the floor. You probably couldn't open the door because the bed was in the way. The only way, it reminds me of um, one time I was interrailing with someone and we were... <laughs> Uh, interrailing is when you travel around Europe on trains, and um, it was one of the things I did as a student. Um, you paid so much, you could go wherever you liked. Um, but you used to be able to get free night sleep if you, if you slept on the train. So you'd try and get a night train with a long journey, so, so you didn't have to pay for a hostel. Uh, but the compartment trains, the seats go down. I think some of the trains are still like this. They're going to go down and make beds. So you've got th six seats in the, in the compartment, but you push down the two on each side, and it makes three beds. So we were in Italy, and, um, and we were traveling up from Italy somewhere on this uh, train, which didn't need a supplemento, which was a good sign. Um, anyway, we were traveling along. Anyway, in the middle of the night, it was about two in the morning, the doors opened, and then this lady, who, as you would imagine, it's Italy, starts speaking Italian to me very, very loudly, turns on the light, and we're all like <laughs> fast asleep. Anyway, so we have to, we have to kind of realize, I think what she wants is for us to kind of make space for her. Anyway, so we did this, and we put up all the, put up all the seats, and we're all like, oh, so tired, so tired. Anyway, so about 10 minutes later, the train stops at the next station, and she gets out. She only wanted 10 minutes, and it was like... <laughs> But because she wouldn't let go, it's like we were thinking, oh, if we just turn up, she'll go away. She, she won't. She was, I mean, we were about 18 at the time, so it's the kind of thing that, don't listen, kids. Just, just a terrible, terrible, terrible things that I did. Um, but thought we, we might kind of get away with it. But because she kept on asking, albeit I didn't understand a word she was saying to me, I worked out. I was not very perceptive. I could work it out. The light going on and the shouting angrily. Um, we made space for her, and we were like... <laughs> It was just like when she went, you're like, okay, all right. But in the same way, um, in the same way, Jesus says it's a bit like that when we pray, that somehow God gives us a persistence that is unreasonable. I mean, I try to think of it now as an adult going onto a train. There's a room full of young blokes uh, that are all fast asleep. Would I open the door, flick the light on, and start shouting at them? I probably wouldn't, actually, because, I, I, you know, that's me, isn't it? Some of you would, though, and you know who you are. Yeah. <laughs> so, so that thing of persisting, of not taking the first answer as no, as, 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 the, as the end. It reminds me of Isaiah 62. It's a really strange picture, though, because it's like is, God is not in bed and asleep when we pray. Okay? He's not kind of saying, no, I can't answer you now. I'll answer you in a few hours when I've had a bit of kip. You know? That's not God's answer to us. The point of the parable is that if we can get some lazy neighbor to give us some bread, how much more will God be faithful to answer our prayers? It's not just here, though, that talks about not giving rest. Isaiah 62 says, I've posted watchmen on your walls, Jerusalem, and they will never be silent day or night. You who call upon the Lord, give yourselves no rest and give him no rest till he establishes Jerusalem and makes her a praise of the earth. It's kind of a bit like Jacob, when Jacob is wrestling with, the, with, with God, and he meets this man, and, and he says, I won't let go of you until you bless me. There is this part that God's given us in prayer at sticking with something until we see it coming to pass. It may be that we don't see the answer we want straight away, but God wants us to be those that will stick at it, because in sticking at it, he changes us. In sticking at it, he's transforming us, so we're ready to receive the answer that he has. You know, sometimes we can feel frustrated that, that the answer doesn't come. But what I'd like to say is, this thing of persisting is, is really important, and particularly important in the time of battle. The next verse in Luke 11:6 6 says, So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. 
seek and you'll find. Knock and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives, everyone who seeks finds, and everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. In terms of language, I understand that that is present imperfect. I walked along the road and got home. I've finished with that now. I'm no longer walking along the road. I've done with it. This thing of everyone who asks, it's not just ask. It's asks and keeps on asking. Everyone who seeks and keeps on seeking. Everyone who knocks and keeps on knocking. For Jesus said, for what father amongst you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much, will the, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Now, some of you know that I'm a... Oh, sorry. So, ask and keep on asking. Seek and keep on seeking. Knock and keep on knocking. Some of you know that I'm a little bit of a warrior. Uh, and um, I don't particularly like that part of myself. I like to take Jesus' verse that says, don't worry, and see that as a commandment to myself. But I've been thinking about it, and I've been thinking, you know, the thing about worry is what you do with it. The person who's giving himself no rest until he sees Jerusalem established is not really, is not really sort of taking lots of time out to do other things. It's kind of constantly in their mind that they want to see this thing happen. Now, if you find yourself preoccupied by things, what I'd encourage you to do is to actually turn that back towards God. Because I think he may well be drawing things to your mind to seek his face about them. Does that make sense? We're like at that door trying to get the bread. We're like, we're like the watchman on the wall who's not going to be silent until we see Jerusalem established. There is something that God wants about us to be persistent about sticking at things. And that thing which is negative, that thing which is, that the enemy intended to harm us, you know God intends for good. Um, one of the things I've been doing this year is um, I've been listening to, mainly, and also reading um, the Bible in one year by, on the Bible app by Nicky Gumbel, which some of you may have come across. I've discovered this joyful thing that actually... I don't have to listen to the news when I drive to work. I can actually put my phone on, speak here, and it speaks to me, and it, it actually reads the word to me, and it actually also gives me a thought for the day and things like that, which is somewhat better than another thought for the day that you could be listening to. And one of the things that we've been doing is going through Genesis, and we've been going through the whole story of Joseph. And I had not, I'd forgotten, I know how the story of Joseph, and I refer to it all the time. How long is the story of Joseph? How long is it? How long does it take for this point to come when he's reinstated with his brothers? It's just so many chapters, so many things happen. And as you actually hear someone read it, or you read it yourself, it really kind of brings it home to you that sometimes our stories are very long, our lives are very long, and what God does in them takes a long time to happen sometimes. And when you're in the midst of the story... It doesn't really feel like God is using something which the enemy intended to harm for good. But when you get to the chapter, whatever it is in Genesis, which I can't quite remember, 50-ish, um, you, know, you can see what God has done. And you can look back and you can say, wow, that's what God intended. This thing that, God may be, that you may have in you, which is a tendency to be concerned or to worry, I believe that the enemy may intend to harm you. The enemy may intend to get you into a cul-de-sac of despair, to get you into a place where you can't see the light. But what God wants to do is to use that to be an intercessor, to really seek his face about things. This is something which God wants. He wants us to be those that will be lifting up those causes around us, those people, those people we're longing to see breakthrough for, because it makes a massive difference. You know, sometimes the darkness can... If you're a worrier, sometimes the darkness can feel overwhelming. Maybe you can't sleep. The world is pushing in on us. In today's little episode, so this is just what God's been speaking to me about today in the, in the Bible in one year. In today's little episode, um, the commentator referred to the, the situation, the miners' story. 
Do you remember it from 2010? I've got a little video that I'm going to show you. These miners were trapped 624 metres below the ground. What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear, all because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. I think as I watched that um, YouTube clip, I think that for some people they feel like they're in that cave, 624 metres under the ground. Now we have a choice when we're in a cave like that one. We can just give up or we can pray. Isn't that a remarkable story? It reminded me also, I was talking to someone else about the story of Jonah. Uh, and they said, they asked me if I thought Jonah died in the fish. And I said, well, no, they didn't die. How do I know Jonah didn't die in the fish? Well, because when he was in there, he prayed. And after he prayed, the fish, and he repented, the fish spewed him out. You know, sometimes we're in the belly of a fish, and, and God causes us to pray, and he turns things around. So... I wanted to just look at that to kind of encourage us. I believe that intercession is vitally important. I believe it's something which God has given us that's not a defensive but an offensive weapon. It's something which, if we want the church to move forward, we have to move forward in prayer together. So I wanted to just sort of stir that in, in, in the church, really. That I believe there are a number of you that have that gift. And uh, I think God's made you to be warriors. And I think that 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 is something that we can, we can encourage as a gift in one another. So if you know someone who's a warrior, encourage them. If you know it's you, confess it and say, look, I think God's given me to do this. Does that mean you go to your room and close the door and pray? Well, Jesus said that is how we should pray. There's an element of prayer that is like that. But it's also praying when you're in, in the car driving to work or stuck in the tube when you can do nothing else because your face is crammed up against something else. It's quite like being in the belly of a fish, isn't it, really? So, okay, and so then the other side of this I want to look at today is fasting. Um, as you know, many of you have been around for a while, we always called First Tuesday Prayer, First Tuesday Prayer and Fasting. And we kind of, we stopped talking about fasting probably about three years ago, I think it was around then, when we felt that perhaps we got to a point where it, had lost some of its significance for us, and we wanted to just let it settle and see what, what came of it. And, um, and I feel that God's stirring us to think about fasting again. So, so what, I, what I wanted to do was to just explore a little bit about where fasting comes in the Bible, what kind, what, what, it, what it's like, and who does it. You see, what fasting can't be is just something I do because, because, because that's what's going on around me. Any more than turning up here on a Sunday because my family are here, you know, is a good thing. I can get in the way of God's blessing through it, but actually there should be an engagement from the heart. In Joel chapter 2, God says through the prophet, Even now, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. Rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love. And he relents from sending calamity. Who knows, he may turn and relent and leave a, behind a blessing. Grain offerings and drink offerings from the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion, declare a holy fast, call a sacred assembly. Fasting is about reconnecting with God, or just connecting with God. It could be that you haven't particularly lost connection, but fasting is a way of, of turning to him, of saying, this thing that matters to me, this stuff that I take in through my mouth, mainly through habit, probably, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to do that for a moment or for a while, for a period, and we'll talk about what kinds of periods you might do later. I'm not going to do that because I want to focus on him. I want to use that appetite, use that energy to do that. Another example, 1 Samuel 3. Um, yeah, so 1 Samuel 3. Uh, the people of Jabesh Gilead heard that the Philistines had what they'd done to Saul. They killed him uh, and, 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 and terrible things had been done to him. All their valiant men marched through the night to Bethshan. They took down the bodies of Saul and his sons from the wall of Bethshan and went to Jabesh, where they burned them. They took their bones and buried them under the tamarisk tree at Jabesh and they fasted for seven days. 
This is an example of a corporate fast. This is an example of something terrible happening. It's not normal to fast like this, but the whole community decided that they were going to fast. I say the whole community. I don't think they had a democratic vote. The leadership said, this is what we're going to do, and everyone joined in. I think that there is a place for us to be responsive to leadership. So if the, if the leadership is saying, like, I think we should fast this week, then it should be a joining in. Again, I'll talk about the practicals of what that, what that means. King Ahab got into terrible trouble. Lots of things went wrong in his life. And he was rebuked by the prophet. When he heard these words, he tore his clothes, put on sackcloth and fasted. He lay in sackcloth and went around meekly. Daniel was talking about sackcloth this morning, actually, the sackcloth of turning our sackcloth into garments of praise. When the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, he said, have you noticed how Ahab has humbled himself before me? Because he's humbled himself, I will not bring this disaster on his day, but I'll bring it unto his house on the days of his son. Doesn't sound great, does it? Bring it on the days of his son. But there is a, there's a relenting of a judgment here, a holding off. It would still be up to the son to repent. You know, the son, well, let's not worry about the son. The important thing is that the that there is a reconnection, a change, almost a kind of changing of mind of God in response to the sincerity of his repentance. Fasting doesn't twist God's arm, but he does always respond to a true heart. If we just fast without any connection with God, then we just get hungry. There is some teaching around in the church that sort of seems to suggest that the, the more we fast, the more we can expect kind of uh, God's uh, approval of us, his, uh, his love, his, uh, his generosity in prayer. And you, you kind of, you can pick it up. But when God answers prayer, it's grace from first to last. When God blesses me, it's never anything to do with me. It is never my fasting that kind of gets me in the way of God's blessing. And I just want to rebuke that because I think that's a religious spirit and I think we need to be really careful of how we approach fasting. It is not, this is a rule, a new rule. If God's going to answer my prayer, I've got to fast. No, you've lost it, mate. That is not the point. The point is about drawing near to God. And fasting can help us to draw near to God. That's our pri- He's our primary focus. He is who we want. He may answer my prayer. He may not. He may answer it in the way I want. He may not. I want him. Because I have no one else I can turn to. Grace is always his undeserved goodness to us. And we never deserve it, by definition. Because there is a kind of fasting that God doesn't like. In Isaiah 58, you can read the whole kind of chunk. I've just picked out a few verses here. This is from the section, verses 2 to 8. Why have we fasted, they say, and you've not seen it? Why have we humbled ourselves, and you've not noticed? Yet on the day of your fasting, you do as you please and exploit all your workers. Your fasting ends in quarrelling and strife and striking each other with wicked fists. Great phrase. Is, is this not the kind of fasting I have chosen? To loose the chains of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke? To set the oppressed free and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter? When you see the naked, you clothe them and not to turn them away from your own flesh and blood. So he's not really, this is, this is not a good advert for fasting, this, this particular, these particular verses. You know, it, it, God is much more interested in our actions. In Jeremiah 14, 12, he says, Although they fast, I won't listen to their cry. Though they offer burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. Instead, I will destroy them with sword and famine and plague. Whew. The fasting God wants has to be about more than going without food. It has to be about an active decision to go his way, a positive desire to grow close to him, to be that thing, that living sacrifice every day. I might have fasted in the past because it was expected of me. I might have fasted in the past because everyone else was. I might have fasted in the past because it's just what I do. But that isn't the true practice of fasting. I need to repent of that. If you have done any of those things, we need to repent of that kind of fast before we can fast truly to draw near to him. So, so far, I've just, been in the, uh, I've just been in the Old Testament. Of course, Jesus fasted. And um, he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where he fasted for 40 days 
and 40 nights. And the Bible helpfully tells us he was hungry. You cannot naturally fast for 40 days and nights. It is a spiritual gift. Please do not go home today and try and fast for 40 days and 40 nights without God telling you to do so. You will be ill. But don't see this extraordinary fast as being impossible to attain and therefore I'm not going to fast. What it does tell us is that Jesus used fasting to draw near to God. It was an act of personal devotion. So rather like he chose to be baptised, therefore I chose to be baptised, if I'm a follower of Jesus, I'm going to fast at some points in my life when I want to draw near to him. See, the marvellous thing about fasting is it has to be in the 95%. Just fasting for the meetings doesn't really count. I always fast when I'm at church. No, that doesn't, that doesn't work. I never eat on a Sunday morning between 10.30, sorry, 10.25, hey, 10.25, and, well, around 12.30. I'm not going on that long. But fasting is something which is something which has to take over our life. Jesus advises his disciples, when you fast, don't look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show others that they're fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. Which is like they look hungry, I suppose. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face, so it will not be obvious to others that you're fasting, but only to your Father who is unseen. And your Father who sees what's done in secret will reward you. I think that's quite an important... This is a really important thing um, for us as a community. And for when we're in the 95%, we don't mostly get extra kind of points probably in the communities we work if we say that we're fasting for a day. You know, no one says, oh, wow, that's amazing. They might think you're a bit weird or whatever. But there's a, there's a way we can fast which is kind of hidden, that doesn't draw attention to itself, and there's a way we can fast which is not like that. We must not become distracted by impressing others or lose sight of the purpose which is always to draw near to God. Does that make sense? So we might have special times when we say, look, actually, you know this Tuesday, it's first Tuesday prayer, why don't we fast together? It'd be a good thing to do. But we don't have to fast together to get the reward. We fast when we feel God called us to. Jesus also talks about fasting because his disciples don't fast, and John's disciples do, and he, he's quite clear that it's not always a time for fasting. Sometimes it's a time for feasting. It is something which God gives us as a tool now, you see, not everyone, sorry, I'll stick, stick on that for a moment, not everyone can fast, right? If I'm diabetic, I can't fast. Um, it may not be appropriate, you know, if you're pregnant, I'm not pregnant, uh, but if you're pregnant, then you, it's not maybe a good idea to do that. And sometimes you might be responsible for cooking food for others in your home, and it might be difficult to actually figure out a way of making it work. Maybe you live with people who aren't themselves Christians, who would not really understand if their teenager suddenly said, oh, I'm, I'm not going to eat my meal tonight. And they might be worried about you not eating. So maybe you can't fast. I don't think food fasting is all there is. You can use other things to fast. Fasting is kind of going without something which you have come to rely on and you just take for granted. So you might like to think about those sorts of things that might generate time in your life for drawing near to God. It may be it's appropriate that for a time you gave up watching TV. Or it might be that for a time you... You probably do that for 40 days and nights as well, by the way, without any harm. You, you might decide to, to go on a mobile phone fast or a data fast, a smartphone fast, maybe a coffee fast. Oh, no, I couldn't do that. Sh maybe, maybe, you know, maybe just sugar sugary, sweety things, as opposed to things that are good for me. Does that, is that because God wants to make my life miserable? No. This is about saying no to an appetite and saying yes to God. That, that's what fasting is about. Um, 
Obedience, not performance. Don't be discouraged if you try to fast and it's too hard if you've never done it before. It gets easier when you get more mature. Your metabolism, as a, I've discovered, as a 48-year-old <coughs> man, is not the same as a 22-year-old man. And it doesn't, I can go without food for some time and I don't really notice. Uh, my waistline notices when I do eat food as well. So, um, but God wants obedience, not performance. Fasting has to come from the heart, not external constraints has to be something I choose to do. God is already listening to our prayers. In the story of Job, sorry, just took a moment to click, click, click. In the story of Job, Job is going through all manner of terrible things. And in the middle of it, he says, I know that my intercessor stands before God and intercedes on my behalf. God is already interceding for you. And when you pray, he's interceding for you. That you, sorry, when when you fast, he's interceding for you, that you would meet with him. It may be that meals are an important social aspect of a household. Sometimes small children kind of, it's a bit weird. Mum, Dad, not eating tonight? Oh, I don't get that. Um, I've discovered the joy of fasting from dinner to dinner. If I literally don't eat after one dinner, and and I snack in the evening, so my fast does start at that point. If I don't fast from dinner... Sorry, if I don't eat from dinner right round to the next day dinner, I haven't disturbed the family's eating at all. But I have fasted. Now, you could say, well, it's not 24 hours, is it? Well, it sort of is. It's just about 24 hours. And it doesn't, it doesn't need to impact the family in the same way as when Dad's being grumpy and not eating meal with us. And when you've got young kids, that can be significant. So I just put it out there as a thought. Um, Be prepared for a battle if you've never done it before. Food can be provided at the most inopportune moments. You can be in the middle of your day's fast and someone, a colleague who never speaks to you can decide to offer you a bar of chocolate or something in the middle and you kind of go, no, it's okay. Just don't make a big deal out of it. It's okay, I'm I'm fine now. Oh, go on, go on, go on. Fine now. Start with what you can do and use the free time to focus on him. The focus is on God, not food. The focus is on God, not your mobile phone. The focus is on God, not the TV. That's, that's what it's there for. I mean, I didn't even just see Jack out the corner of my eye. Just, um, yes, my, my son attempted a how many days fast? Two, well, he managed to two, but it was supposed to be longer, wasn't it? But then the poor chap was suddenly then really, really, really ill. So he managed like two days and then was suddenly violently ill and really had to eat something because he was just... And that's what I mean about your metabolism changing and knowing how your body works and and all those things. Just, you're getting what I'm saying. This is about grace, it's not law. This is about a tool I can use to help me focus on God. And um, I, I, I have found significant times of breakthrough in recent weeks when I have fasted. I, can, I can't tell you the detail, but there's been a few situations where I've thought, you know, I really want to see a change here. Well, I can tell you one. I can tell you one. We were, we, were wanting to, we, were wanting, we were waiting for an appointment for something at a hospital, and it wasn't coming through. It wasn't coming through. Um, we were expecting it to be months and months and months ahead because that's the kind of way it was. And we fasted, and on the day we fasted, the hospital phoned up with the appointment on like two weeks after another appointment, which they'd already given us, which was completely unexpected and a complete breakthrough. I, I am personally experiencing that God is answering prayers when I fast. I'm not saying he's answering prayers because I fast. What I'm encouraging you to think about is that it is a tool we can use to make our minds, make our bodies be more in line with him. So this week then, think about First Tuesday prayer. We're still calling it First Tuesday prayer, but maybe God wants you to think about a fast. Draw near to him if you decide to fast and expect to meet with him and draw from him all day. See, there's this thing which is my life in the kingdom and there's a little tiny bit here which is kind of my experience of church or church meetings or whatever I may not get the theology exactly right on that but the thing about fasting is it 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 impacts the whole of my life yeah and so when I'm teaching you know in the middle of you know 11 o'clock in the morning I'm still fasting I may not be praying I may be talking about Newton's laws of motion but I am still fasting and my body is still praising God is still I'm still making sure that my body is in line with him, uh, and and so on. And that's about it. So, point three. Uh, Be a prayer for battle? No, sorry. Yeah, okay. All right, yeah, so God is already listening to our prayer. Okay, yes. So we've already said that grace is about, God, God listens to prayers because he's attentive to us. He doesn't slumber or sleep. He watches over us. He's always there. So when we pray, we know that he's already hearing. 
But fasting helps us to tune into him and fight with the enemy. Remember we said our battle was not against flesh and blood. So one of the things that we can do is to, is to quieten our flesh and blood so that we can pick up what's going on in the spirit. And that's what I think fasting is about. It's about saying, look, I am a spiritual being with a physical body. I'm not a, I'm not a physical being who, who has a spirit. There's a slight difference. My body is not its home. My spirit is eternal. And so this body might need food, and it does need food. It needs to be looked after. I haven't mentioned drink. I would never go without drink, actually, if I'm fasting. I know that our people who pray on a Friday, that those, those <laughs> particularly, those, you know, the, the Muslims will go without food and drink. That, I, don't, I, don't, I don't particularly feel that's what I should be doing. I think it's about food. Um, I think there's some evidence that there were, there were certainly some times when people went without drink in the Bible. When Jesus stood up and said in a loud voice, is anyone thirsty? It was because people had been without drink for the whole day. But, but actually, I don't, th- I don't feel that's what God's given me to do in fasting. I, I, I leave it with you to decide. You have to be careful of drink because we dehydrate and it can affect all sorts of things in health terms. And we understand that. We are trapped in this physical body. So we have to kind of look after it, yeah? All right, um, does, that, does that make sense? Yeah? So I have a song which Daniel's going to help us with, possibly. No, no. So here's the thing, right? So I'm preparing all of this, and um, I'm reminded of a song that I used to sing with about 20 other old ladies in a church in Barnet. So what do you mean? Why are you laughing at me for saying other, other old ladies? I mean, I, I, I am not an old lady. But here's the thing. God reminded me of, of the words, because I, I don't know, who, was that me or was you? Um, God reminded me of the words. What a friend we have in Jesus. Now, some of you will never have heard the song before, but others of you will have done. It is a hymn. It's quite an old hymn. But hey, if you take something home, I hope I've stirred you up a bit about what fasting is about. But I I want us to take home this thought of, you know, if you're in that cave underground, waiting for the drills to get through, there is something that you can do about it. 